Hello, and welcome to our Flame Detection Technologies Overview. My name is Dave Olpheim, and I'm a Business Development Manager at MSA. Today we're going to talk about optical flame detection, and you know, occasionally, unfortunate, unfortunately, accidents still occur in, the, in global industries, and, and these, I just put these four panels here to illustrate some recent worst-case events. You know, and, and basically just to illustrate there is a need for reliable, fast responding flame detection in applications like these. And what we're talking about is fire. And, and fire has development stages. And, and the first stage of a, of a fire is a incipient stage where we have you know, some smoke, not much, but primarily invisible aerosols are generated. The next stage, uh, as this fire triangle, after this fire triangle has been completed, is the smoldering stage, where now we have some visible smoke along with some CO. We, we don't have a fully developed flame yet, which comes next. Now we have a, a flaming stage where you've actually got uh, an open, open fire, open flame with high levels of CO2, and then eventually the heat stage or the flash over. Now we've got a lot of heat. We've got aerosol. We've got such, so much heat from this flame it to actually carry the fire to other areas. And the reason I point this out is that it's the flaming and the heat stage where an uh, optical flame detector is actually applicable. Without a flame, you know, you're not going to have the energy level required to, uh, to create an alarm. Um, and then in the middle of the bottom, I show basically the once you have this ignition, um, I wanted to show the curve of, of how a fire reaches the fully developed stage or equilibrium stage. And this is important not necessarily for gaseous fuels, but for some liquid fuels like, like kerosene, fuel oils that take a while to, to reach that fully engulfed stage. And, and that, that is important from the, uh, from the approval agency's perspective. And in fact, the next slide shows you the anatomy of a flame. And, and essentially the chemistry, the point of this slide is really to talk about the fact that the chemistry of the material burning results in a unique spectral signature. And, and this just shows, you know, again, some of the ultraviolet light at the, uh, at the root of the flame more the infrared energy, the, the uh, yellow flickering at the edges of the flame. And then the, uh, in, in the plume of the fire, you have these different uh, basically chemicals that are a function of the material being oxidized. And in fact, if you look at that signature, we'll see that on the next slide. The, the hydrocarbons, as you look at energy as a function of light wavelength across the bottom, You'll, you'll see these emissions, and in the ultra, you'll have some ultraviolet, you'll have some, some mid-infrared, and then you'll have, uh, as well, you have some light, some smoke, some airborne you know, soot and debris. But one characteristic very common to hydrocarbon fires is this CO2 emission peak centered on the 4.3 micron uh, light wavelength, and that is a, a consistent signature of, of all hydrocarbons, ranging from solid materials to liquid materials. And that, that, what that, the net result here is that that is a, a frequency of light that most manufacturers of optical flame detectors um, are very interested in, in, in measuring. This, this slide shows you, uh, the, the key takeaway here is I wanted to show the, the ultraviolet uh, spectral sensitivity wavelength. Um, that we, over on the right, we've got the 4.3 micron. CO2 emission, you've got an emission peak for hydrogen flame detectors. But my point here is, uh, on this slide, is simply to talk to the point that optical flame detectors in good working order will not respond to the sun. And this slide illustrates why. You can see the sun's radiation reaching the Earth, other than a little bit intersection on the, on the 2.5 micron uh, frequency, which actually is, is, uh, is tuned out. The uh, detector in good working order will not respond to the sun. And that's because this radiation levels just are insufficient or don't even intersect the spectral sensitivity bandwidths that we're, we're measuring. You know, optical flame detectors started with ultraviolet um, measurement, uh, ultraviolet sensing. And, and these detectors use a geiger muller UV photo tube. They provide a, a pulse signal output uh, in response to UV photons. And the signal processing around the UV detector compares that pulse train, that pulse output level, to a preset fire alarm threshold. Traditionally, it was uh, 25 pulses per second. Uh, they bring to the table a wide sensitivity range and very fast response. They unfortunately had also had some drawbacks, meaning they would respond to lightning and welding, which led to the development of a complementary optical sensing technology uh, in infrared. 
And infrared sensors are usually basically a pyroelectric uh, crystal solid state sensor fitted with an optical filter to allow it to measure specific frequencies of light. As you can guess, 4.3 microns is, is one of those key uh, frequencies. Also, additional signal processing requires not just that energy level in the infrared, but also a modulation or a flicker rate because hydrocarbon fires breathe. They have a, they have a flicker, and that's part of the signal processing program requirements. And they are optimal for hydrocarbon fire detection. And what's happened in, the, in, the, in recent times now is that uh, these sensing technologies are used in combination to enhance both their detection of a real fire, but also they're enhanced their rejection of non-fire sources, of nuisance alarm sources. And, and the two key technologies, the two most common technologies uh, used in the industry today are combination ultraviolet infrared flame detectors and then multi-spectrum IR or infrared uh, MSIR flame detectors as well. Both of these types, though, use a, a similar um, field of view as shown on this next slide. This is the key benefit of these tech detectors. They have a field of view where they can be installed, and, and so by installing them in a, in a uh, optimal location, they can be then aimed to cover the area to be protected. And essentially, you've got to, as an end user, you've got to identify where you believe the most likely ignition point is going to be, and let's put that detector in an area to monitor that space. Um, it, it, there are a lot of uh, detectors out there. It's important from an end user perspective to have a, uh, a, a, be confident that the flame detector you're installing is capable of seeing the fire you expect, and that's talked about on the next slide. Factory Mutual, they, they provide some, some certification, they provide certification on performance to different fire types, and those are listed here, including heptane, alcohol, JP4, you know, kerosene-based jet fuel, propane, also methane is an option, propylene or class A fires as well, you know, solid materials. They'll also perform false alarm immunity testing and then also fire alarm response testing with, with false alarms simultaneously present in the field view to make sure they're capable of delivering the performance claimed by the manufacturer and expected by the client. So this is really, this is a really valuable, uh, uh, essentially, uh, certification. And we would certainly recommend customers always consider uh, certification uh, of detectors before they're installed. And to talk a little bit about false alarms, they're out there. And, and in fact, they can be surprised. In fact, with the case of a flare stack, it actually is a fire. And the point here is, of course, that the, the intent is the installing detector not see that fire. I don't want you to see. I want you to cover and see, detect the fire up. We must see. And, but that's the whole point is that false alarm sources are bound industrial job sites. We recommend identifying these during the discovery phase of your project. Uh, and you can see if it's a, there's just a, a significant number of them. Uh, if it's a, a airport, you've got jet engines. You've got uh, arc welding often in many areas. So you've got truck exhaust and boilers and turbines, reactors in the oil and gas industry. You've got lightning and grinding of metal with a shower of sparks. You've got electrical um, transformers with corona discharge possibly present. And in, in many cases, you've got x-ray operations going on in, in different um, pipeline type of work and welding inspections and so on. So, so it's important to identify these and consider these present, these, uh, these false alarm sources in the, uh, during the design phase of your project. Another important attribute to, to uh, require on your flame detectors is a self-test function. And because why? Because compromise or dirty optics will adversely impact any flame detector's performance. Their optical devices, if they have a dirty window, they're going to be compromised. And so uh, a, a, our type of testing is called uh, Continuous Optical Path Monitoring, or COPM, and it's a built-in self-test. It tests uh, essentially what happens is the microprocessor energizes a small built-in lamp once every two minutes to validate that the windows are not dirty, that the test source is, is functioning properly and the sensors are, are have you know, adequate sensitivity. And we also support uh, a test on demand. So there's various ways that uh, end users can, can test it, even though it is testing itself every, every minute or two to ensure it's uh, um, uh, fit and, and uh, performing well, it can be triggered on demand. So the next slide is a quick summary of these technologies in comparison to one another strengths and limitations. So with MSIR, multi-spectrum detectors, you have a, a detector that detects most hydrocarbon fuel fires. It, um, 
excuse me, has very high sensitivity or can have high sensitivity and a, an overall extended field of view, which is optimal for large area monitoring. They're really good in areas that are dirty, oily, that don't see frequent maintenance, the optimal maintenance, if you will, and a kind of similar on the same line, a good option for smoky and sooty fires. But because it's an infrared device, it can be blinded by water, ice, and snow. And this is common of all IR detectors, that uh, water, anything you absorb infrared energy, like water, ice, and snow, is going to be a, a something to be considered. Because of that long-range uh, sensitivity and long-range field of view, a careful aiming on site is required to just ensure if there is a flare or other energy source nearby, we're going to control our field of view and prevent it from seeing or responding to those adjacent uh, sources. And because the uh, multi-spectrum IR has a fairly complex um, algorithm, it, it requires a little, a little longer time to process the signal. So it may be a little slower in comparison to UVIR, UVIR, but still in compliance with the certification requirements by FM and others. With UVIR detectors, you have a detector who's good at detecting hydrocarbon fires, and in some cases, non-hydrocarbon fires, such as uh, hydrogen, sulfur, um, and other, other non-hydrocarbon hazards. They typically have a wider field of view, which is optimal for short range, uh, wider spaces. They can be very fast. Here, the signal processing is an AND gate where the UV and the IR must be present simultaneously before you get the alarm, so they can be very fast. Uh, and they offer a UV pre-alarm, which can be useful, again, in electrostatics or electrical transformer apps where arcing, sparking, or corona uh, electrical discharge can be a precursor to an actual ignition event. They have weaknesses as well. They can be blinded by silicones, dirt, oil, Solvent vapors affect the UV side significantly, as well as uh, water and ice on the IR side. So with a combination of, of sensing types in a single unit, you end up with, with uh, contamin basically um, contaminants sensitivity for both types. Um, because they use an AND gate, the, the, on any infrared source in the uh, field of view can satisfy the IR. Um, and likewise, in a similar way, ultraviolet, which can be detected at very long distances, may satisfy the UV side uh, of a UVIR detector, and, and you end up, you know, partially in, uh, in or, or in a situation where you're partially at that AND gate being satisfied, and, and it may not take a whole lot of energy on the other sensor to end up with an alarm. That's a quick summary, but they both provide uh, significant benefits, and those are talked about here, which is reliable certified performance. You've got the ability uh, at a job site to adjust this field of view, or aim it to where you believe the fire is most likely to uh, occur, and cover a significantly large area to a variety of different fuel types. Um, we have programmable sensitivity and time delay options, different signal types, so 4 to 20, or, or relay outputs, or Modbus and other heart, um, enhanced loose and alarm rejection, something that's really come along in the last few years and an onboard intelligent diagnostics for those end users. So uh, it is amazing what the detectors can do. But it's important to follow the best practices around, around uh, installing these detectors. And that's what the, the comes talk about that here. Uh, best practices around you know, achieving a high-performing system include executing a HAZOP analysis, HAZOP operation analysis, and a kind of an ignition scenario analysis. What are the events that are most likely to occur on site that are going to lead to a, a fire ignition. And once we've got that um, basically done, we've got the results basically gathered, we can then consider the effectiveness of different detector placement options and coverage uh, angles, if you will, of those detectors. We've got to have proper mechanical and electrical installation considerations done. In other words, it's got to be a solid structure. We need to have uh, compliant electrical uh, installation, you know, conduit or cabling or, and power distribution considered. Once we've got a fault-free system, then we can consider the commission of that system and, and whatever our routine performance testing is to ensure it's in good health. We need operation and maintenance practices well-defined, basically a logbook, uh, physical inspections and testing. And that means training for our operators, for our maintenance people, for anybody responsible for the, uh, for the management of that system. Well, we hope you found this a useful presentation. We do have some recommended complimentary webinars on YouTube. This is found at the MSA Safety Fixed Gas and Flame Detection Playlist uh, channel. 
and those include gas detection technologies and a little deeper dive into best practices around managing your flame and gas detection system. And please contact us if you'd like us to you'd like us to help you do a site analysis on your fire and gas system. We we really enjoy that. We have a passion for safety. We certainly hope to hear from you. And uh, here's our email: fgfd at msasafety.com. Again, we hope you found it a useful presentation. And please let us know if we'd be of assistance in the future. Thank you.